how to start trusting again after being burned. I was in love. She was my wife, and I thought she was my best friend. Debbie and I had been married for six years when I learned that it was all an illusion. We were living in Portland at the time. Debbie had recently taken a job as an internal auditor for the largest real estate firm in the city, and I was in sales for a national machine tool manufacturer. Given my product line, I was rarely in the city center. Most of my clients were in the suburbs or remote areas of western Oregon, but this day found me in town with an extra two hours to spare. I called Debbie, invited her to lunch, and was disappointed when she told me she needed to finish a spreadsheet before an important meeting that afternoon. I didn't want to miss the opportunity, so I went to Jake's for a plate of crawfish etouffee. I enjoyed the nut brown sauce with my rice while listening to the women at the table behind me and wondering how they did it. All four women seemed to speak at the same time. This is not the first time I have witnessed this phenomenon, and it has always puzzled me. Men cannot do this. I sat there smiling to myself, trying to understand how anyone could understand this gibberish, when something one of the ladies said stuck in my head. The ladies' question intrigued not only me, because the other three women at the table immediately fell silent. So, Deborah Miller is messing with Simon Walker? This question immediately caught my attention because my wife's name is Deborah. She uses this name in her professional life. Only family and friends call her Debbie. And Miller is the name she has been with me since we got married. My name is Mark Miller, by the way. One of the ladies asked, Why are you so sure that you know? The first one replied, I was sitting in Deborah's office when her husband called her. She refused his invitation, under some excuse that she was working during her lunch break. Five minutes later, Simon looks into her office and asks if she's ready. She nodded at Simon and then blushed and looked at me. She was obviously embarrassed to have heard her lie to her husband. My heart sank at her words, but my ears remained alert while the other ladies continued this stream of gossip. It didn't take Simon long to sink his fangs into another married woman, did it? Deborah has only been in the office for a month. And it's only been two months since Heidi Johnson left. I heard that her husband forced her to leave after he found out about her affair with Simon. Can you imagine a mother of two preschoolers falling in love with Simon's bag of lies? What is his secret? You mean, besides those big blue eyes, Ryan Gosling's face, and, from what I hear, a pretty good endowment down there? All four women started laughing. I had heard enough, so I paid the bill in cash and went to the car. The rest of the day passed in a blur, trying to figure out how I could confirm my worst fears. If Debbie cheated on me, we're screwed. So would I hire a private investigator to follow her? Or were there other ways to do this? For all this, I called Debbie's office and pretended to be a salesperson. The administrator kindly informed me that Mrs. Miller was not at home and would return at two o'clock. I tried so hard to keep my fingers crossed that the gossip was unfounded. When Debbie returned home that evening, I tried my best to act normal, although I almost lost my temper when she apologized for not being able to have dinner with me. She even had the nerve to kiss me on the cheek while apologizing. She asked if I mind making dinner because she wanted to soak in the bath for a while before we sat down to dinner. She poured herself a glass of wine and headed into the master bath. This was probably her way of cleaning up the evidence. Coming home and taking a shower would have been too obvious. Debbie was smart enough to use the bathtub as a disguise. How many more nights did she use this trick? I quickly prepared a salad and a tray of cheese and crackers and headed to the bath. I undressed in the bedroom and entered the bathroom completely naked. Debbie nearly jumped out of her skin when I walked into the bathroom and started getting into the tub. Mark, what are you doing? Trying to scare me to death. Well, if you remember Deb, I live here too. Just thought we could share the hot water. Debbie has a cue when she is lying or takes time to answer a question. She doesn't know she has it, and I never told her about it. I've seen this from time to time. Just last week I saw her tell when a good friend of ours asked Debbie if she liked her new hairstyle. Debbie blinked twice and then told her friend that she absolutely loved it. Debbie let her speak before answering me. I was just leaving because I was absolutely hungry. 
is supper ready? You've probably guessed that Debbie uses words like absolutely. Before Debbie had a chance to wrap the towel around herself, I did my best to examine her. No telltale bite marks, etc., and I couldn't get a good look at her shaved crotch without it being obvious. As the water was leaking from the bathtub, I thought about taking a sample of the water and getting it tested, but had no idea how to do it. Catching Debbie turned out to be incredibly easy. That night, I downloaded a self-published book called The Amateur Detective onto my Kindle. Catching a Cheating Spouse It only took me a couple of hours to read the basics, and the next morning, I finished two assignments while Debbie was in the shower. First, I checked Debbie's calendar on her smartphone. Yesterday at noon, Debbie blocked out two hours with the note, Work until lunch. I noticed that on the previous Thursday, the same two hours were blocked with the same note. How clever of her. The second task was to download a tracking app to her phone. It was too easy, and after thinking about it, I checked my phone. What a bitch. I had a similar app on my phone. I quickly deleted the app from Debbie's phone. There is no point in raising your hand too early. I saved the application on my phone. It may come in handy in the future. Every morning I checked her calendar. Tuesday morning turned out to be a good one. Between noon and two there was a note. Work until lunch. After breakfast I went to my office and did my best to get something done. On my way to work, I picked up my phone at Walmart. At 11 is I forwarded my regular phone to the new phone and left my regular phone on the table. If Debbie checks the tracking app she has installed on my phone, it will show that I am sitting 20 miles from her office. If she called me, I could answer the phone. I arrived downtown in 15 minutes and checked into the Starbucks across from her office building. At the stroke of noon, she walked out the front doors with a man. Damn, he actually looked like Ryan Gosling. I left Starbucks to follow them. This may sound crazy, but following the advice in the book, I wore a baseball cap, sunglasses, and a small rock in my right shoe to help me change my stride. None of that mattered, because the two lovebirds only had each other's attention as they walked hand in hand one block to the lobby of the vintage hotel. I decided I had almost two hours, so I went across the street to the bank and started transferring some money, closing our mutual credit card accounts and home equity account. Debbie and I also had credit cards in each of our names. She will find out about the closed accounts later, when it no longer matters. I also called my company's law firm and received a recommendation for a divorce attorney. I called her office and made an appointment for the next day. With half an hour left, I returned to the hotel lobby. I waited in the lobby, trying to keep a low profile, pretending to read the Wall Street Journal but actually watching the elevator doors as the two of them descended. I woke up. Debbie. Debbie stared at me with a shocked expression. Mark. God. No. Simon was ready to play the hero because he stood between me and Debbie and started saying something about being careful, holding out his hand like some damn traffic cop. I think Debbie forgot to tell him about the boxing class I was taking, because he didn't seem ready when my fist went into his stomach just below his solar plexus. He knelt down. Debbie just stood there, still moving her mouth like a damn fish. Before she could say a word, I told her, Maybe it's best to leave the room for the night because I don't want you coming home tonight and maybe ever again. Unfortunately, right after I got home that day, a squad car pulled up and when I opened the door, I was handcuffed and taken to the Multnomah County Jail and booked for assault. Simon pressed charges. As a result, I spent the night in prison, and the next day I was released due to my own intelligence. When I got home, it was obvious that Debbie was in the house because most of the small and valuable things, including the watch my father left me when he died, were gone. I checked the closet and found that Debbie's clothes were also missing. Good riddance. I still had time to shower and catch a meeting with my lawyer. Over the next three months, the following happened and not in any particular order. The charges against me were dropped because I was lucky. The front desk clerk told the officers that Simon had assaulted me and she saw him raise his hand. To her, it looked like he was ready to attack me. I think she was the kind of person who was happy to see any creep who entertained a married woman get his due. She wasn't actually lying. 
she was simply interpreting Simon's actions in my favor. I only communicated with Debbie through our lawyers. She tried, can't we do this? I firmly said no, and the divorce papers went through the system. When I refused to agree to counseling, Debbie flew into a rage and tried to get over half of our community assets, child support, etc. My luck continued after Debbie because my lawyer argued that even though we lived in a no-fault state, I shouldn't have to suffer the consequences of her actions. The judge was swayed. My lawyer took a unique approach. She revealed that while Debbie had the opportunity to write her own vows, she agreed to traditional vows that included leaving all others, so I expected fidelity. Secondly, we had testimony from Debbie's colleague about a conversation in Debbie's office when she declined my lunch invitation in order to have lunch with Simon. Third, you could hear a pin drop when it hit the court. Debbie took my father's watch while I was in jail. The judge tried her best to keep a neutral expression as she listened to this testimony, but she was clearly impressed. Even Debbie's lawyer cringed when the statement was read in court. I got a divorce and my watch back. Debbie and I shared everything we had accumulated during our marriage, and she did not receive any alimony. Debbie asked for one more, and she was granted. She asked to meet with me before the final paperwork was signed, sealed, and delivered. What the hell? I agreed, at least out of curiosity. So we sat down in her lawyer's office, and she started talking nonsense about how much she loved me, how sorry she was for falling into Simon's trap, and how she thought we were a great couple with a great future. When I heard enough, I decided to bluff. Debbie, tell me about the others. Debbie blinked twice before answering, Mark, since we've been together, I've never been with another man, absolutely honest. I shook my head. Goodbye, Debbie. This must have made Debbie very angry because three weeks later I received the CD in the mail. It's hard to believe. I always thought Debbie was a pretty smart woman, but on the CD there was a tape of Debbie and Simon having sex. It all started with a fully clothed Debbie looking straight into the camera. Mark, this is for you. Eat your heart out. The entire video was only 15 minutes long, but it was one of the hottest 15 minutes I've ever seen. I seriously considered sending links to the site to Debbie's parents, friends, and employer, but ultimately decided to de-escalate the war. I never told Debbie about the Tumblr account, but I did send her an email warning her that more videos like this would end up on her dad's computer screen. Debbie actually... Debbie responded with an apology and a lame explanation that she was still hurt by how it all ended and that she was trying to make me jealous. She promised to stop. I'm a pretty stoic guy. I'm sure most people who know me even think I'm a little cold. After the divorce, and even after watching the video, I didn't cry, I didn't spend a week drunk, and I didn't think about eating my gun. I was sad because Debbie had been my best friend for the six years we were married. Her betrayal deprived me of all trust in other people. If you start to think that people are untrustworthy, you will begin to see this in your daily interactions with people. I'm pretty sure my college psychology classes called this a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, when the bartender or salesman gave me change for 10 instead of my 20, I decided that they were trying to scam me. Little things like this turned me into a cynic. My job in sales didn't help either because it's such a brutal environment. As for women, I had my usual routine, chasing skirts and hanging out in bars, some kind of lonely existence, until I met. A year after my divorce, I met Becky at a dinner party thrown by some clients. Becky was beautiful, with green eyes, blonde hair, a body that would be on the cover of a Victoria's Secret catalog, and most importantly, the personality of a woman you would be proud to take home to meet your family. Her smile and laughter could light up a room, and they definitely lit me up. At this dinner party, I did everything I could to be the most charming and most interesting person in the world so I could sell Mexican beer that night. If only I could sell myself to this lady. As we were about to call it a night, I approached Becky and asked if I could take her out to dinner the following weekend. How can I say no, she asked. You worked so hard tonight to make me want to say yes. That effort should be rewarded. Is it obvious? 
Yeah, but I think it's cute. I also asked our hostess what she thought about you, and she said you have potential, so let's go next Friday and find out. After two months of dating, we decided to become exclusive, but we took our time and maintained separate residences, although we spent four to five nights a week together. Every single one of my friends fell in love with her. And best of all, I started to fall in love with Becky and felt that she might fall in love with me. Sex began immediately after the promise of exclusivity. A gentleman should not kiss and tell. But without going into too much detail, I will say that it was the best sex of my life to that point. Nothing was off limits to her as long as it was limited to what two people could do with each other. We had fun in and out of bed. Yes, I started to think that this was my ticket to happiness. And then the bottom fell out. My clue that something might be wrong came one day when Becky and I took time off from work early one morning and were hanging out drinking beer. Becky's phone rang. She looked at the reading and ignored the call. This was unlike her. She usually answered the phone and told someone she would call back later. After my ignorance with Debbie, I became more observant and suspicious. I had no intention of playing the happy cuckold role again. Later that evening, I had the opportunity to take her phone and look through her call list. At 3.30 a.m., she missed a call from someone listed in her contacts as J.R. Looking through the call log, I found several calls between the two of them. I then went to Becky's calendar and found that she had an appointment with J.R. the next day at 1 bus p.m. It's time to find your baseball cap, sunglasses, and shoe stone again. On Thursday afternoon, I was at the sandwich shop across the street from Becky's office building. She left the building alone and headed north on Broadway before entering the Marriott. As soon as I entered the lobby, Becky and a man walked up to the front desk and were talking to the front desk clerk. I couldn't believe my eyes. How could this happen to me again? When I approached the two of them, I almost felt sick. You're cheating on me, you lying bitch. Becky turned around and looked at me. I don't think the look on her face would have been different if I had shot her with a gun. The man she was with looked at me and asked, Who is this? Before Becky could answer his question, a second man with a Marriott name tag approached. He stared at the three of us in confusion, but before anyone could say a word, Becky ran out of the lobby. Everything happened too quickly, but I read the second man's badge. Greg Houston, catering manager, and then looked back at the first man. The first man broke the silence. I understand. You are Mark. I'm John Riley, the man Becky hired to coordinate your surprise 30th birthday party here at the Marriott. I think you just ruined everything. After that day, Becky never called me back. A week later, I woke up to find on the porch in front of my townhouse a box of things I had left in her apartment. Inside was a note that simply said, I don't want anything I left at your house. Give it all to charity. Becky. Over the next six months, I panicked. I ate, slept, and went to work. One afternoon, I decided to go out and attend the annual Portland Craft Beer Festival that was taking place on the waterfront. I was just lucky to meet Becky there. She was with a guy, and they were clearly a couple. After introducing us, Becky asked if she could talk to me. To his credit, her boyfriend said yes. Mark, I'm sorry I never spoke to you again, but at that moment I was so hurt and so angry. That night I called my mother and she told me that you are spoiled and running for your life. I listened to my mother's advice and left you alone. Becky, I wish I could be mad at you for how it ended, but unfortunately, I think your mother is right. Debbie's betrayal hurt me more than I imagined. I deserve it. I was an ass. Mark, get help. You are too good a person to live the rest of your life alone because one person betrayed your trust. Find someone who can help you, be it a counselor, a priest, or someone else. I'm sorry I couldn't help you, but I'm not the person to make you whole again. We almost had something. Thanks for the advice. I think you're right. I need to pull myself together. Thank your boyfriend for giving us the opportunity to speak out. You deserve a guy who trusts you enough to do this. Say hi to your mom for me and tell her what I said. She raised a beautiful woman, and her instincts were right. We walked away from each other, and I saw moisture in her eyes. I had to quickly turn around before she saw my tears. So where do you go when you need to re-sync and get your life back on track? 
Where should I have gone when my marriage ended? I took three weeks off and went home to Chicago. Time to play the prodigal son. Mom still lived in the house we grew up in on the north side of town. I was the only one of her children to move out of the area, so she wasn't alone. My older sister had two children, and my younger brother had three. I teased him that his wife was a regular baby machine. Three kids before his 30th birthday. Mom was busy with five grandchildren, but I knew she missed me, although I can't figure out why, since she always claimed that I was the reason for her gray hair. On our second day in town, my mother invited my siblings and their families to a big feast. She served my favorite dish, homemade lasagna, and my favorite dessert, chocolate cheesecake. Like I said, all sorts of things about the prodigal son. I played the long-lost uncle and gave each of my nieces and nephews some expensive electronic gifts that most of them were too young to use. You could see their parents' eyes roll at my stupidity, but I think they appreciated the sentiment. After everyone left, my mother and I washed the dishes together and had a chance to chat. Mom wasn't one to give advice. It was always Dad's job, but Mom always knew what to do. Your buddy Hank Taylor still stops by from time to time. He asks, how are you doing? When was the last time you talked? Not as often as we should. And before you say it, yeah, it's probably my fault that we don't communicate more often. Call him. Hank was my best friend. From the moment we met in kindergarten until I left for college. From K-12, we were inseparable. In Little League, he was a pitcher and I was a catcher. For six years of football, he was a quarterback and I was his receiver. I quit baseball my freshman year because I was a mediocre hitter at best. And the track coach noticed my aptitude for the pole vault and high jump in gym class. I quit football after my freshman year because my father was afraid I would get injured and ruin my chances of getting a college track scholarship. In my junior year, I was one of the top high school pole vaulters in the country, and the University of Oregon was going to recruit me. My father's decision to keep me out of football had a negative impact on Hank's life. Our football team just missed out on announcing our junior year. Much of our success was due to the Taylor-Miller combination. I was Hank's number one target. His senior year was a down year. Most receivers had glass hands, and his statistics weren't good enough to earn him a college football scholarship. He received a baseball scholarship to Southern Illinois and excelled. Hank knew my father and his influence on my decision. He was never mad at me for leaving football. I got into UO and was on my way to the Olympics when a terrible accident ended my pole vaulting career. During warm-ups at the NCAA Finals, my pole broke in two, which is a one-in-a-million occurrence. I fell at an awkward angle and hurt my knee so badly that it took two years of therapy to get back to 90%. By that time, the Olympics were already over, and I received my bachelor's degree. I also had a quarter of a million in the bank after the pole manufacturer settled. With me at Oregon and Hank at SIU, we started to grow apart. I was one of his friends when he married Janice, and the last time I was home was after Janice gave birth to her second son. It had been a little over two years since I last saw Hank, and if he was angry at my carelessness, he didn't show it. Thirty minutes after I called his house, we were sitting in his backyard drinking beer. First, I learned what was going on in Hank's life. His job, a Chicago firefighter, his wife, Janice, and his two sons, Mark and Hank. Then it was my turn. Hank heard about my divorce from my mom, but she didn't share the details. He was less surprised by these events than I expected. He was surprised when I told him how my relationship with Becky ended and how I had trust issues. After Debbie cheated on me, it became difficult for me to trust anyone. It just seems like it's every man for himself. Hank stared at me before answering. It's because you've been hanging out with the wrong people for the last 12 years. Let me tell you a story you don't know. For the three years you and Ginny dated in high school, I had a crush on Ginny. Yes, I can see from the look on your face that you had no idea. And that's how it should be. A friend never messes with a friend's lady, no matter what. Remember that trip to my uncle's cabin in Door County? You had to work on Friday and the girl I was going out with at the time was Stacy. Ginny and I went to the cabin on Friday morning to get everything ready. And you and Stacy will come over Friday evening after work. Your car broke down 
and you didn't get there until late on Saturday night. So Ginny and I are going to be alone all night because we got a call saying you're stuck in Milwaukee, we're drinking cheap wine, Ginny is still in one of her bikinis from swimming in the lake, and to top it off, there's a blackout in the cabin electricity, and now we are sitting by candlelight. And you want to know what happened that night between me and Ginny? Nothing, because a friend never crosses that line. And if I hadn't been a friend and tried to attack Ginny, do you know what would have happened? Nothing. Because Ginny was the kind of girl who would never cheat on her man. You went to Oregon and left people you could count on to follow your Olympic dream. That's okay, but you shouldn't have replaced your friends with self-centered grabbers. I feel sorry for you, Mark. It took me a few seconds to process what Hank had said. Then I thought about Ginny. Do you have any idea where Ginny is and what she's up to? I haven't seen her since the first Christmas when I came home my freshman year at Oregon. Ginny was here a couple of months ago. Now she is a widow with a five-year-old son. Widow? What's happened? Her husband's last tour to Afghanistan. He was shot. She didn't go into detail. But I understand that he won several important medals for bravery, unfortunately, posthumously. Ginny tries to hang in there for the sake of their son, but you can tell she's barely holding it together. She still lives in San Diego County, close to the base, and his fellow officers are looking out for her. She'll probably be happy to hear from you if you're interested in her email. Is she still sexy? Did anything happen between you two while she was in town? When I asked for this, I looked over my shoulder to make sure Janice couldn't overhear our conversation, but the storm door was closed. You didn't listen, Mark. What the hell happened to you? First of all, I would never change Janice. Secondly, Ginny would never have sex with a married man. That's just not who we are. I need to get my head out of my ass. Only Hank Taylor could talk to me like that. That evening I sent a letter to Ginny. Ginny Hank Taylor gave me your email address. I hope it is not inappropriate for me to contact you, but I will be in the San Diego area this weekend and was wondering if I could invite you and your son to lunch or dinner on Friday or Saturday. Just to catch up. Warm regards, Mark. Early Tuesday morning, I received a pleasantly unexpected response to my email. It's great to hear from you after all these years. Friday lunch is good for me and my son Kevin. My address. I will expect you at noon unless I receive a different answer from you. Your friend, Ginny. Hank had been on duty since Tuesday, which meant he would be at the firehouse until I left town. But he invited me to tour the station and have lunch with his team. I accepted his offer and sat at the table with the actors later that day. It's still hard for me to explain the feelings I felt as I sat between two of Hank's fellow firefighters. They were both willing to answer my questions. They were probably used to civilians being sensitive to what they considered routine. The need for trust to perform one's tasks when fighting a fire became apparent. The only way each firefighter dared to enter a burning building was to realize that their teammates would have each other's back and get the job done. It was probably then that I began to realize that my life had gone downhill. Back in high school, I replaced baseball and football, two team sports, with individual track and field events. Although the overall performance of the track team depended on others, my contribution was based solely on my efforts. Even the profession I chose, sales, was similar to this. Whether I made a sale or not depended almost entirely on my efforts. The only team achievement I could point to since I was 15 was my marriage to Debbie. I flew into San Diego on Thursday, rented a car, and checked into Coronado. On Friday, I drove north to Ginny's house, one of the apartments in a four-unit townhouse. I called and waited, trying to hide a bouquet of flowers from a nosy neighbor. I almost dropped the flowers when the door opened. My God, Ginny was more beautiful than she was at 19. She was wearing a bright blue sundress and had a little boy wrapped around one of her legs. Mark, welcome. She put her hands behind my head and kissed my cheek. This is for me, she said, pointing to the flowers. It was a stupid question, but I think she was trying to get me to say something because I was still standing there, frozen. I responded by handing her the bouquet. Thank you, Mark. Please come in while I put them in the water. Mark, this is my son, Kevin. Kevin, this is Mr. Miller, an old friend who I went to school with before I met your dad. 
Kevin extended his tiny hand and said, Hello, Mr. Miller. Finally, I found my voice and said, Hi, Kevin, shaking his hand. While Ginny was putting flowers in a vase, I looked around the apartment. The first thing that caught my attention was the folded flag in the center of the bookcase. On one side of the flag was a photograph of a Marine. Attached to the frame were two medals, a purple heart and a navy cross. It's my father. I looked at the photo from the other side of the flag. Ginny with her husband and baby Kevin on the beach. At that moment, Ginny entered the room. Ginny, I'm sorry if something is wrong, but this is a beautiful photo. You three look very much in love. You must miss him. No need to apologize. It's a pleasant memory. And yes, we were madly in love. I met him at Northwestern University. He was in the ROTC program when I was studying journalism. My classmates wondered why I fell in love with a military man. Most of my classmates had little respect for the army. But in addition to being strong and confident, Chuck was someone you could count on and had a heart of gold. And again, that word is trust. Ginny's eyes watered slightly as she looked at the photo, so I broke the silence. Are you still going to have lunch? Yes, we need to make it. Come on, Kevin. Mr. Miller will take us to Red Robin. Kevin was very encouraged by this, and we got into Ginny's car instead of moving the car seat into the rental car. During the drive, the conversation became more upbeat, and by the time we entered the restaurant, the three of us were laughing at some stupid joke Kevin told us. Lunch was wonderful. Although since we last spoke, Ginny has gone through so many changes in her life. Marriage, child, widow. She was still the same. Kind, smart, cheerful, and charming. At one point, Ginny asked me why I was in San Diego. I was embarrassed, but I decided to tell the truth. I told you about how both my mother and Hank scolded me. So, the truth is that I came here to apologize to you for the way I ended things back then. You deserve better and were completely honest listening to you tell me about your marriage. You did much better. What are you going to do now? Are you going back to Portland? My flight is not until Sunday evening. I think I'll spend the next couple of days on the beach, running and trying to recover. I have a lot to think about. Kevin relieved his boredom by coloring with the crayons the restaurant provides for the children while the two adults were engrossed. But two hours later, we went back to Ginny's. Mark, would you like to go to a barbecue at my friend's house tomorrow? What, and skip the day contemplating your navel? You're asking a lot. Ginny laughed. Well, if you change your mind and decide to go to the barbecue with us, pick me up tomorrow at 11. Dress casually in shorts and a polo shirt. Oh yeah, bring some beer. I told Ginny I would, kissed her on the cheek, and shook Kevin's hand. As I drove back to my hotel, all the reasons why I loved Ginny for three years in high school came back to me. The next day, Ginny, Kevin, and I went on a picnic. Ginny was wearing white shorts and some kind of t-shirt with a bra. The shorts weren't too short for a family picnic, but they showed off the shape of her athletic legs. The top just hinted at her cleavage, sexy but discreet. She pulled her blonde hair into a ponytail. Aviator sunglasses hid her brown eyes. After we parked the car, Ginny took my hand to introduce me to her friends. As we approached a small group of men, apparently Marines, I felt them studying me. And I got the feeling that this outing was partly a test to see if I was good enough to date Ginny. We met and Ginny left me to make sure Kevin was around the other kids. At least that's the reason she gave me. I said to the group, I hope this is not a cliche, but thank you for your service. Captain John Clayton was in charge of the group. It doesn't matter whether it's corny or not, it's always nice to hear. My father served in Vietnam, and I see the joy in his eyes when we walk together. I'm in uniform, and someone thanks me. Not at all like his experience after returning from Nam. Then the conversation moved on to more pleasant topics, including a courageous icebreaker, a sports one. The day passed quickly. I spent some time with Ginny, some time with the men, and even spent an hour in the kitchen with the ladies swapping cooking tips. At the end of the day, I was invited to join the men at the local tavern after bringing Ginny home. Kevin was asleep in his car seat. Well, did I pass? 
I think so, but Doreen will probably call me after you leave for the tavern. I'll get another call tomorrow after the men report to their wives tonight. I hope you don't mind too much. It's a close-knit group that looks out for each other. I'll always be a part of it because Chuck, he and John Clayton were very close in Afghanistan. I held my breath and decided to ask the question that was running through my head. So, the fact that I'm being tested means you want to keep dating me? Yes, Mark. We've both changed since high school, but I still have something in my heart for you. If you want to continue seeing me, I would really like that. I'd like that too, Ginny. Let's start checking. We laughed, and I remembered how much I loved the sound of her laugh. It will probably be late when I leave the bar. Can we see each other tomorrow, that is, if I pass the tests? Ginny laughed again. I usually go to Mass at ten. You can join me for Mass or come later. She looked me in the eyes. When was the last time you went to Mass, Mark? Besides, funerals and weddings, at least ten years have passed. I slowly left the church when I moved to Oregon. I didn't stop believing. I just stopped going to church. We drove up to her house. I carefully lifted Kevin out of the car seat and carried him to bed. I turned around and saw Ginny in the doorway, looking at us with a smile on her face. I went up to her, hugged and kissed her. She kissed me back. See you tomorrow. I'll be here at 9.30. Wish me good luck. I walked into the bar and was greeted by five men, including John Clayton. The bartender poured me a pint, and the six of us sat down at a table. John was obviously the leader here, so he started the business. Mark, we're not trying to make your life difficult, but you have to understand that the three of us at this table, including myself and the bartender Roddy, all owe our lives to Chuck Turner. Did Ginny tell you anything? About it? No. I saw the Navy Cross and knew it had to be something special, but I didn't want to get involved, so I didn't say anything. Well done. Showing respect. I will tell you. We were on patrol in the mountains near Pakistan when we were ambushed by about 40 Taliban insurgents. We couldn't call for an airstrike because it would cause an avalanche. We couldn't retreat because they would hold the high ground and beat us off. Chuck ordered us to flank them while he and Rodriguez remained in position to bring them in. It took us three hours in this rough terrain to advance to the rear Taliban. Chuck and Roddy kept them busy for three hours. We managed to flank, and being on high ground, we were able to destroy them. But by the time we reached Chuck and Roddy, both were wounded. Chuck had four wounds and was still fighting. He died in my arms. Roddy was unconscious with wounds to his head and leg. Roddy has a prosthetic leg, so he works as a bartender and is not on active duty. That's why Ginny is our responsibility. At least until someone comes along and relieves us of responsibility. Someone worthy. I understand, John. Let me answer you this way. Ask Ginny if I ever did anything disrespectful in the three years we were together. My worst sin was letting her go, but I think it worked out better for her because she met Chuck and they had a son. I didn't have the maturity to be a good husband or father back then. I have never touched a woman in anger even when I caught my first wife with another man. I may not have what you have, the courage to attack the men shooting at you, but I am not a coward either. I wouldn't back down if it meant protecting the person I love from harm. I recently realized that I am a little self-centered, but I will work on it. So now that I know how things are, let me ask you all. I stopped to look around the table. Do I have your permission to continue dating Ginny? People might think it's a bit over the top to ask permission to date an adult, but I saw it as a way to show respect for their obvious concern for a Freen's widow. I wasn't pretending but I'm a good salesman because I'm pretty good at reading people. And it was the right question because the answer was a wide smile from John and the others. Roddy, can you bring us something tasty? Let it be Knob Creek. Rodriguez brought seven glasses, half filled with amber liquid. John raised his glass to make a toast. Captain Chuck Turner Rodriguez joined us and we all touched glasses and drank. We stayed for a couple more hours, drinking slowly to avoid getting drunk but covering a variety of topics. At some point, I was told why Ginny wasn't dating anyone right now. John told me all the information. Ginny and another Marine started getting serious last year. 
The problem was that Ginny couldn't take another Marine seriously, especially after losing her first husband, and Tom lived his whole life wanting to be a Marine. Tom told Ginny that he would leave the Marines, and Ginny told Tom that if he did, she would never speak to him again. Tom transferred to Lejeune right after that, and Ginny hasn't been serious since then until she received your letter. Doreen said she called that day, honestly excited about your visit. Don't say what I told you. I won't say anything, but thanks for sharing. The next day, my affair with Ginny began. I racked up some serious Alaska air-frequent flyer miles flying between Portland and San Diego. Every weekend spent with Ginny and Kevin. Hotel rooms were more expensive than airfare, and Ginny wasn't ready for us to consummate our relationship. John and Doreen were kind enough to put me up in their guest room. At home, I tried my best to work on my interpersonal skills. Even my boss noticed the difference in my behavior. I joined the company softball team in San Diego. I played doubles tennis on the base courts. Ginny was my partner, and we got along well with new partners. This was my fifth trip to San Diego, three months after my first visit. I walked out of the terminal and into Ginny's car. When I looked back, Kevin's car seat was empty. Where's Kevin? Doreen and John will have him this weekend. I have a surprise for you. I hope you like it, was Ginny's response as she pulled off the side of the road, exited the airport, and drove north on I-5. Ginny didn't tell me anything else about our destination, so we moved on to other things. She told me that Kevin was disappointed that he wouldn't see me until Sunday. He really got attached to me. I could tell Ginny liked it just by the tone of her voice. As we drove, I noticed that Ginny was wearing the same blue dress she wore to our first dinner, but this time she had no bra under her dress. We stopped at the La Jolla Beach and Tennis Resort. She smiled broadly at me. I think it's time, don't you? My answer to her question was a wide grin. As soon as she parked the car, I grabbed her and kissed her. You know I've fallen in love with you again, don't you, Mark? Well, thank God, because I've been hoping you'd do this since that first weekend. I love you, Ginny. What a weekend. Ginny and I ordered room service and made love all Friday night. It's funny, we had sex two of the three years we dated in high school, so you have some expectations of what it will be like. But the passing years had toward us both a thing or two, thank God, because what we did that night had nothing in common with the bumbling awkwardness of those two teenagers over 12 years ago. We played tennis on Saturday afternoon and made love on Saturday night. On Sunday morning, she surprised the hell out of me by taking us to the nude beach under the cliffs in Torrey Pines. Ginny kept her bikini bottoms but removed her top. I plucked up my courage and took off my swimming trunks for half an hour before, Worried about sunburn, I put them back on. How did you know about this beach? Don't tell me you've done this before. Don't say anything. But Doreen and John come here from time to time. Doreen told me and swore her to secrecy. Now you too have taken the oath. We saw some people watching and even thought about playing volleyball, but decided that maybe next time. I thought that playing volleyball with a group of naked teammates would be a great way to improve my interpersonal and team-building skills. It was early afternoon and time to pick up Kevin. So we headed back to the rocks and headed towards the Clayton house. John greeted me with a firm handshake and a bottle of beer. Doreen hugged me and smiled widely. Kevin hugged my legs. We had dinner with the Claytons, and Kevin spent the entire evening next to me. He looked sad when Ginny dropped me off at the airport. On the way home, I made a decision. Two weeks later, we went back to Clayton's for a Friday night drink. When John and I were alone, I told him, I'm going to ask Ginny to marry me, unless you have a reason why I shouldn't. I would be disappointed if you didn't. She's madly in love with you, and I can't think of a nicer guy or anything that could make her happier. Does this mean she will move to Portland? If she says yes and agrees, I will work to move us back to the Chicagoland area. She misses her parents and siblings. That's great, Mark. I know she talked about her family with Doreen. How are you going to handle this with Kevin? I'm going to invite him to lunch tomorrow and talk. Keep your fingers crossed for me. You might be surprised by his answer. This guy likes you. The next day, Ginny gave me a strange look when I told her that Kevin and I needed to run some errands together. But I got away with it, 
sitting it as a time to bond with the guys. We heated straight to Red Robin and grab at a table. Over two milkshakies, I asked the question. Kevin, what would you say if I asked your mom to marry me? Would it be okay? I held my breath, waiting for his answer. That would be great, Mr. Miller. My mom really likes you. And you, Kevin, do you like me enough that I can live with your mom and you? Yes. Does that make you my father? Something like that. No one could replace your real father. What did you call him? I called him Daddy. Then how about your mom and I get married and you call me Dad? Will this be okay? A sweet smile appeared on Kevin's face and he answered briefly, Of course. We returned to his house. I figured it would be difficult for Kevin to keep our conversation a secret. As soon as we walked through the door, I had a ring in my hand. Kevin was carrying a bouquet of red roses. Ginny smiled when she saw the roses, but looked embarrassed as I fell to my knees. Ginny, will you marry me? Not very original, but right to the point. Ginny fell to her knees and hugged me. Yes, I love you, Mark. That's all I needed to hear. Kevin hugged us. Unfortunately, he forgot to drop the roses first, and the thorns scratched my neck. Fortunately, it was probably the worst thing that happened during the years of our life together. My life with Ginny is blessed in many ways. We got married three months after I proposed. By then, I had found a great sales job at a startup north of Chicago, close enough to our families and our old friends. Kevin now has a brother and a sister. They all call me Pop because that's what Kevin calls me. Ginny still looks amazing after three kids. We still play doubles tennis and please don't tell anyone, but we have learned to play volleyball and play at Black's Beach whenever we visit the Claytons. Last May, our family met with the Clayton clan in Washington. We did the usual tours and on Memorial Day, we visited Chuck's grave in Arlington to pay our respects. Ten years have passed since Captain Turner was taken from his wife and son. It was a sad, dark, and proud day. I was glad John and Doreen were there to help me comfort Kevin and Ginny. It took a whole day for the smile to return, and pain could be seen from time to time for several days. But it was right. To pay our respects to any person, whether in the military, police, or fire department, who willingly lives his life knowing that someday he may have to sacrifice everything in the performance of his duties. We returned from our trip and it took a few weeks, but everything was back to normal, even with a flag, medals, and a photograph of Captain Charles Turner on the bookcase. For me, I'm glad I opened my eyes and ears and learned what trust really is. Even Hank stopped threatening to kick my sorry ass, although he still gets mad at me every time I pass a cutoff man during our softball league games. My excuse is is that I was distracted by a beautiful blonde with three cheering children in the stands. My life is good. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.